podcast listeners. This is Lisa Butterworth, and I am here today with Amy Elisa Hedrick, and she is a sex therapist and licensed clinical professional counselor here in Idaho, and I invited her today so that we could talk about what the process of opening up a marriage might look like in doing it in a really healthy and constructive way. Welcome, Elisa. Hello. Thanks, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Well, let's see. I've been practicing as a therapist for 19 years in the state of Idaho, and I've been specializing in sex therapy for 10 years. And throughout that time, I've been seeing quite a few, um, you know, obviously here in Idaho, we have a large LDS population. And so that has been a large portion of my clientele. Um, a little bit more about me. I, I did also complete a couple of years ago, um, another a certification in alternative relationships and BDSM and kink, which specializes in working with consensual non-monogamy and people interested in getting into more kink or how to navigate that kind of lifestyle, um, a BDSM or kink lifestyle and alternative relationships. So yeah, that's been something I've been working with quite a bit. Um, I also do other things in my practice, breath work, um, facilitator and things of that nature, but um, this is definitely an area I'm passionate about. Well, one of the reasons why I asked you specifically is that I have quite a few clients who are in this area. And they're not always actually people who are sort of identifying as ex-Mormon. I also, I don't know if this has been your experience, but I also have clients who come in who are still sort of active participating Mormons who are participating in different kinds of alternative relationships. And that isn't something that I was super aware of that existed prior <laughs> to getting these clients. Absolutely. Yeah, that is... Um, and working within that framework is definitely a little different, you know, how to help people navigate balancing their, their religious beliefs and perspectives and the dogma of the relationship, and then also navigating, you know, who they are individually and what's a fit for them. Right. My specific concern this last couple of weeks actually has been, I, I've seen, I mean, I, it seems like things come in, in in waves and lately I feel like I've gotten a big wave of um, clients coming in where it really, like the women in the relationship in particular, and it doesn't always go this way, but it just happens that this week it was. So the women in particular were maybe reluctant or not that interested in alternative relationships or in opening up the marriage. and. Um, some, and as they describe some of the ways that their partners sort of pressured them into participating, um, it became clear that they really needed some help to figure out, like, what does it look like to sort of navigate this process without bringing sort of pressure or making something not consensual? Um, and I, and so I thought you would be a great person to talk to about like, what does this process look like when you're doing it in a way that brings a lot of he sexual health mm -hmm. to the table? Absolutely. I actually, I forgot to mention that I actually, that's one of my areas that I um, enjoy focusing on is creating sexual agreements between couples and what that looks like because opening up or at least doing the preparation work and the education and slowing down the process in the beginning is really important. Um, and those agreements can be so um, valuable in, in determining like the success and how well they're you know, going to navigate it early on. Because so, oftentimes they learn what not to do by doing it, <laughs> right? And getting it wrong right out of the gate. But yeah, I would, I'd have to say that is something I do see quite a bit of that there's a discrepancy um, between one person wanting to open up more than the other. And that's pretty common. Have you seen that as well? Oh yeah, very much. And sometimes both are open to it. And sometimes one person is very close to it. But even when both partners are open to the idea, there's often a, you know, like very different levels of like, how fast are we going to do this and how soon right. and what types of things do we want to try? Absolutely. Yeah, that and that's one thing that um, I often ask, what does this look like? If you were to play this out in your mind as a movie, how do you anticipate this unfolding? And oftentimes there's a lot of clarification that needs to happen. Like, what does this mean to you? Because in, in the office, they can both sound like they're agreeing to the same thing. And once they leave, they both have heard something very different and have agreed to something very different. 
Oh yeah, I definitely see that. And not just in sort of sexual contracts, I see that in all kinds of things. Yes, yes. Um, where we hear things kind of differently. And so sometimes it's really important to speak back the thing that we have just agreed to or that we thought we just heard so that we can clarify whether that is what the person intended to communicate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I encourage them to also write things down that they think that they've agreed on and be as specific as possible so that they can go back and refer to it. So one thing that I would really like you to cover um, mm -hmm. is to talk about some of the things that would qualify as sort of pressure or, you know, like non-consent because I, um, you know, like I hear about these behaviors, people come in and say, well, he really wanted me to, and I said I didn't want to, and then he asked me again and again and again, and I finally just said mm -hmm. I would to shut him up because, you know, like, what are the type of behavior that you know, like might look like consent to one partner because she finally said yes, but they be, maybe doesn't actually, mm -hmm. you know, like what are, right. like what are some of the things you see that happen? Well, you know, there is a, a lot of pressuring. There can be, um, if the partner is a little resistant or hesitant and not really agreeing up front, sometimes there's anger. There can be um, neglect or withdrawal from the relationship. So there's a little bit of maybe a silent treatment or even a punishing that can happen, just making that person very uncomfortable and not faring, feeling very loved or getting their needs met in the relationship unless they follow through with this. Um, right. And, and even if they may say, yeah, I'm not wanting to do this or not wanting to engage in this, the other person might continue to move forward with it. And open it up anyway and, and engage in communication or inviting other people in even without that other person's permission. Right. Sometimes they might agree to things like taking it slow and, and telling them, yes, this is fine, but then they may not necessarily follow through with it on respecting that person's boundaries and requests. So there's not always an honesty if the one person wants to open up less, the person that wants to open up more may do things without being open and honest about it. And that is one of the keys of the key elements of, of successfully, you know, opening up a relationship and becoming non-monogamous is open and honest. I can't even emphasize that enough. Honest, transparent communication and almost over communicating sometimes, which is hard for people. Um, and having really difficult conversations uh, and, and a lot of times that's challenging because people aren't used to that. Right. What do you think holds people back from having those conversations? Well, one, I think when you've been in a monogamous relationship, I think that you're, most people are not really accustomed to talking about sexual desire, especially if it's something they've never shared with their partner. Um, expressing desire to interact with other people sexually is hard because it oftentimes hurts people's feelings. It affects their self-worth. Um, there's jealousy that erupts and insecurity. And once these things, you know, come to the surface, then they have to be dealt with and discussed and worked through. And so it's, it can be very challenging to navigate because it's bringing up a lot of emotions that people now have to deal with that they never had to face and confront before. So most people have never had to talk about it and don't have the skills that they need. Um, right. And I, one thing that I, I think applies specifically to coming from a Mormon background or, you know, like living in a Mormon community is that we definitely view confrontational relate or conversations or conversations that might cause contention or co conversations that might upset people as being wrong, right? Like instead of seeing those conversations as necessary and difficult, we see them as like, we shouldn't say things or do things that might make people feel bad. Um, and yet sometimes we have to in order to get to a healthy place. Absolutely. And I think that it actually takes a lot of practice to, to develop the communication skills and the problem solving, or at least negotiating and compromising. And, but it takes time to develop that. It doesn't happen right out of the gate, unless some people might be really good at it, but most of the time that's not the case. Right, and so how would you suggest that, I mean, there's two levels of question to this. Like, how would you suggest, if you were thinking like a lot about this and you want to talk to your partner about this, like, where do you start that conversation? Where have you seen people start it where they've been successful and maybe seen people start it where they haven't been successful at getting through those conversations? And then the second layer of that question I want to ask is like, what does it look like to respond? Because this is a big 
this is a big ask. This is a big change in a relationship often. And mm -hmm. so what does it look like to, you know, cause there's a good chance that your partner is going to have a big response and maybe not a positive one right off. What does it look like to respond in a way that doesn't turn into, you know, like mm -hmm. coercion or manipulation, you know, like what does it look like to mm -hmm. hold space for them to have a negative reaction without withdrawing or mm -hmm. demanding something from them? It's different. Well, I think when a relationship is going through um, this type of a transition and an unfolding, that it's best to take it in baby steps. It's like dipping a toe in. So having that conversation, you know, everybody goes about it different. Some people just throw it out there and say, here's what I want. Some people kind of tiptoe around it a little bit. And it's painful to say, I want to have these other experiences or I want us to have these other experiences. And, you know, oftentimes when there are discussions, it's really creating an, a very intimate moment and creating like that sacred space where the two people can have hopefully a successful conversation. I mean, uh, right out of the gate, sometimes it's met with resistance because this type of opening, it often brings up a lot of fear and insecurities. So there can be that an immediate shutdown. So it's really identifying what it is that I'm thinking about what it is I'm wanting to experience and maybe why. And oftentimes people don't really know. They don't, they haven't done their own, you know, introspective work to identify like, what is it that I want to experience and why, you know, how do I want to feel emotionally? What are the physical experiences? So I encourage people to get education, to read books like Opening Up or The Ethical Slut or More Than Two. And there's many more than that. Those are just the ones that come off the top of my head. Um, but getting all the information that they need to equip themselves with, just educating themselves about the process. Because when people don't do that and think they can just jump in really quickly, oftentimes that's a little more messy than if they let it be a slow unfolding process and take it slow. So that conversation might look like, you know, somebody presenting to the other partner that, you know, I've been thinking about this. This is something I've been considering. And here are some of the, and sometimes it starts with fantasy of what um, somebody has been considering or thinking about. What was the other part of the question? Where to start? Yeah. Well, where to start, mm -hmm. where to start having that conversation. And I think the suggestion of fantasy is a really good one. Like, you know, sometimes for some people, and I'm not saying for everyone, but sometimes that's enough, mm -hmm. right? Like if we just pretend right. that we're, um, or we fantasize about inviting somebody else in, or we fantasize, like that Absolutely. sort of fulfills the need. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't necessarily need to take that next step. That isn't always true. Sometimes they do, but sometimes that, but that does sort of like give you an insight into, I think, what what this experience might feel like and some of the things that might come up between us if we try it and some of the feelings we might have in those contexts. The yeah. next part of the question was sort of after where to start having this conversation was sort of like, how do we respond or like, how do we figure out a way to respond to what might be a negative response from our partner mm -hmm. in a way that will lead to sexually healthy outcomes in the end rather than sort of maybe manipulation or control or because having big feelings it can be really normal to want to withdraw right but how can right. we protect ourselves without sort of using that protection as a way to sort of withdraw our affection or mm -hmm. manipulate our partner into doing what we want because we're sad or you know things mm -hmm. like that let's see gosh there's so many pieces to this i think that for the person who's additionally wanting to have the conversation is expecting, right, that this could be hurtful, could bring up a lot of negative feelings and maybe even negative interactions and expecting that and doing your best to let that be okay. Let that, like being understanding and compassionate, being able to hear where they're coming from without maybe responding to it, but providing them with validation, like I understand that this is scary or I understand this is going to bring up a lot for you and this, this is really hard for me too you know, to, to share this. However, it feels important to me, but being able to let them have those feelings and then just asking, is this something, can we come back and revisit this at another time? Can we sit with this and process it? Because sometimes people do need to, they don't know yet what it could look like. So there's a lot of fears and concerns, and sometimes they just need to chew on it for a little while and have more conversations. 
like is it just a fantasy or a role play thing or something that we just talk about in the bedroom and use in our sexy time or what would what would that look like because there's so many options for how this plays out it's so unique to every single couple and sometimes even each partner that as they start to explore and discover what it is that they might want out of this you know type of opening up then you know, that helps them maybe have more conversations about it. So sometimes just requesting, you know, can we just sit with this for a little bit? I know it brings up a lot, but can we come back and rediscuss this at another time? Right. I really like that framework a lot. Sort of just trying to validate your partner's experience, even though it's not maybe the response you were hoping for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and giving them time to process before asking if they'll revisit. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And because I've seen some couples that have, they've talked about it, they've listened to podcasts, they've read literature, they've talked to other people that they know that are, um, you know, in the lifestyle, and they've kind of sat with it for even years, sometimes before they've actually taken action to, you know, let that actually become a reality. And sometimes those people have an easier time because they're slowly moving into the process and adjusting. Whereas other people who sometimes, I don't know if you've seen this, but sometimes they'll decide, hey, we're gonna do this. And then without even talking about all the things that need to be discussed, like for the safety parameters and the, you know, the energy management that needs to take place that's so important, you know having all of those things at least identified when they jump in, it's, it's a little bit, can be messy, I guess. Yeah. And then instead of sort of like, instead of just having like a fun new experience often, then I see the people sort of experiencing like maybe lots of jealousy or lots of unexpected feelings and struggling mm -hmm. to communicate those well with each other. And then sometimes having even damaging or traumatic experiences. Right. And then there's a lot of repair that has to take mm -hmm. place in addition to sort of the contracting and the safety management and the energy management that needed to happen in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so then we're not just doing sort of the planning we're doing, we're trying to do like a ton of repair work. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. So I think laying the groundwork initially, the foundation is really important. And I think people maybe don't realize that it takes a lot of work because the relationship, the, the you know, the main relationship itself, at least in what I've seen work best is when that relationship is is healthy, it's intact, there's intimacy, there's connection, there's communication, and when it is remains to, you know, to be, it's fed first or continues to be fed like and attended to along the way, those oftentimes have a greater chance for success where people often aren't aware of when now all of a sudden this, there's only so much energy we have to go around, right? Work, children, partner, all the other things in our world. And when we start diverting that energy somewhere else, it has to be taken from all of those places. And so that is a, a pretty big deal that people need to consider. And oftentimes they don't know that right out of the gate. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about jealousy and one thing I tell people, what is it that you're hoping to get from this? What are the, the things that you're wanting to experience emotionally, physically, uh, socially? What is it you're hoping to? And what is it that you don't want to experience? What are your worst fears possibly about this? Those are, you know, worth considering as well. Right. So one of the things that I think about that or that I can sort of imagine or hear my own clients saying as you talk about, you know, the fact that it, the, the, if you give this plenty of time, you're more likely to have a successful experience than if you sort of jump right in. You know, like I, I deal with a lot of clients having a lot of grief and loss around the experiences they've already missed out on, you know, that they yeah. often feel like, I, you know, I chose not to do so many things that I kind of wanted to do because I felt like that was the right thing. And now that I've, you know, sort of looked at my moral values and changed my mind about certain things, I really grieve the fact that I haven't already had all those experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and that creates sort of this like fear of missing out, I think this sense of like, I need to hurt. And, 
urgency, right? Yes. I, I yes. get a lot of urgency. I feel like a lot of times people come in with these questions and it really feels like they're on, like they're in emergency mode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, how do you navigate that? How do we move through that yeah. sense of missing out and grief and loss? And yeah, that's a big one because that's almost like a little bit of an existential crisis, right? Realizing, I have a friend who refers to it as, I drank the Kool-Aid and then all of a sudden realized, dang it, you know, there's all these, I didn't realize I was going to feel this way that I missed out on so much. And so really feeling like all of a sudden as this awareness develops, the kid in a candy store, like I want it all and I want it all now. I just want to experience everything that I can. And that's okay, you know, of course, to normalize that and, but urging them to, that's fine, you know, let's process that. Cause like you said, it is a grief. There's a really big shift that's happening and, and being able to, I guess, process that. And, but also I, I think people, they don't want to en engage in opening up and have everything else kind of fall apart. So it's really just cautioning them that it's totally okay that you feel that way. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's actually really common, but how can we do this in a way that is a positive experience for everybody and creates growth and it's successful and just creating more of a timeline and helping them understand why I'm just suggesting that we create a process and slow it down a little bit. Yeah, hopefully that answers. Yeah, so kind of backing up a little bit about something you said about, you know, like the, the places where you've seen this work out most successfully, it's where people are you know like putting a lot of health and care and attention into their main relationship so that you know like the energy around that relationship doesn't feel neglected as we try these other experiences well one of the things that i was thinking about is that often people who come to me in this situation they aren't necessarily in a terribly healthy place in their relationship and sometimes they you know like this is part of their exploration about whether they want to continue to stay in the relationship or whether it's not going to work out in the end for them or not mm -hmm. um and how do you navigate it when when you have clients who you know like because none of us are ideal, right? None of us are coming yeah. in to the office in an ideal situation. And we have a lot of variations of what might not be, you know, like, and, and it just sort of makes me wonder, like, how do we define a good outcome, right? Like, I, I, I think sometimes challenging the idea that a marriage staying together is the good outcome is okay, because sometimes, it's, a, you know, like the good outcome is that the marriage doesn't necessarily stay, right? Like sometimes we just need to gather more information yeah. to figure out what is a good outcome. But anyway, like yeah. navigating this idea of, okay, maybe there are a lot of problems in our marriage. Is this something that we can still approach and how do we manage that? Yeah, that is a big one because you're right, there are sometimes people come in or even after the fact later down the road say, you know, they, it was kind of their exit strategy. They weren't really happy where they were at and that was a way of them getting those needs met or figuring out what they want. And sometimes they're not always willing to put forth the work into the current relationship that they have. Not, you know, there might be resentments that might be a sexless marriage there's a lot of reasons why they might not really want to put energy into that. And they're really excited to put energy into something else. And that's something where I might talk about, well, how do we do this in a respectful manner without doing damage, further damage, right? And, or is it potentially a wake up call to do an assessment? Where is your relationship at? How satisfied are you? And does there need to be some work done here? Because sometimes that's really what's happening. Sometimes it's there's, there's not a willingness to do the work, but the relationship is really suffering and it might need some healing. And are they willing to put energy into that before or during while they're exploring these other interests? Yeah. Those are a little more challenging to work with because there can be detachment. They might not experience jealousy as much, or sometimes people are, you know, together because they're really committed to having a family, committed to marriage, committed to raising the children together but they're not necessarily committed to having a really sexually fulfilling dynamic relationship with each other. Yeah. I just, I just know that it like marriages and families come in millions of different kinds mm -hmm. of forms. I have learned through this process. Yeah. And there are lots of things. I, I mean, I think it's worthwhile to, you know, like look at 
look at what we mean by success. And I think, you know, looking at like what you talked about before with honesty, that like if we can go through this process being honest with our partner, you know, even when those feelings are complicated, even when we might have resentments, we might have, you know, like unprocessed trauma together, um, yeah. like leaning into the honesty can really go a long way, even if it doesn't mean we end up together forever, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it, there can be a lot of healing in, in learning how to communicate through the hard things. Absolutely. And even I think honesty or communicating honestly, especially when it's going to be something that possibly hurts our partner or damages our relationship, it really is creating intimacy. Transparency creates intimacy because we're sharing those deepest, darkest parts of ourself with our partner. Sometimes they can receive it and sometimes they can't. But that sharing who you really are and where you're really at is is really the most loving thing and kind thing you can do. But people really struggle with that. It's really hard to be that vulnerable, especially if there's a negative impact, right? Right. Yeah, because we don't want to hurt each other. I mean, even when we do have resentments and trauma together, we still don't want to hurt each other. And we'll try to protect each other. And often mm -hmm. that protection is, in the end, kind of unkind because we're not sharing our full self with, with the other person because we feel like our full self will hurt them somehow or is bad somehow. Yeah. So another question I would like to ask is about setting boundaries, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, coming from a Mormon background, I see a lot of women who really just don't know where to set a boundary or how to set a boundary, how to mm -hmm. say no, to, you know, because it isn't, it isn't as though we have had a lot of practice about asking ourselves what we want and what's okay with us and what's not right. okay with us, right? Like we come into this often having been told our whole lives what we're supposed to want, what we're supposed to do. And I definitely see a lot of women who have gotten the message their whole lives that they are supposed to fulfill their husband's sexual needs mm -hmm. and they are supposed to make sure that he's happy. And if that involves you know, like going to a sex club with him, even though you didn't want to, you know, like if you don't do that, then you're sort of failing at your marriage. And, you know, often the, you know, like I, I, I hear stories of men saying things like, oh, you're being a prude or you're letting your training, your, you've been brainwashed to not want this, right? And so it can be really hard for them to figure out, well, what do I want like, am I not wanting this because I've been told my whole, whole life I'm not supposed to want it? Or do I not want it because I don't want it? Um, and like, where, what advice yeah. would you give to women who are just trying to figure out like, what, where do I begin? And these messages, like, am I doing this because I feel like I'm supposed to please my husband? Because, you know, like, where do we start to figure out where our boundaries are and what we want? And why is that important? <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. You know, I think when it comes to boundaries, like you're right, we're not taught to identify what do I want in night and what oh, I need because, you know, for a woman, like being selfish is like the most horrible thing you can ever call somebody, right? Making something about us. And so it's hard to really focus on what do I need? What feels good to me and really trusting that, trusting our gut, that intuitive part of ourselves that when you feel into something, like when I imagine something happening in that type of situation or scenario, going to a sex club, how do I feel about it? Is that based on fears or if, am I doing this for me, for us, or for this person? Like in, in a way to check in about that is if I don't go, what are the possible ramifications? What's the fallout going to be, right? So am I giving up? Am I sacrificing my own needs and wants? And just to make this person happy and just to meet their needs, which really just breeds resentment and doesn't do anybody any favors. So, and oftentimes when people are opening up into this, one of the reasons I encourage them to read literature and get information is because they don't even know what to have a boundary about. And so when I start talking with them, okay, so let's like break it down. You know, if somebody was to come in the mix, what kind of communication? And, and oftentimes they haven't even considered what kinds of things would be okay and not okay. And, you know, something as simple as 
communicating with other people on your phone while you're at dinner. That's a really simple thing, <laughs> right? But people really struggle with that sometimes and having a boundary and being able to ask for what you need in a kind way of like, you know, it would really mean a lot to me if you could make this time about us because I find that I get pretty frustrated, right? Being able to state that. So sometimes people don't know how to communicate their needs or their wants and we can feel bad. We've many people have been rewarded for not having boundaries and being these sacrificial selfless beings So we can have, I call them a boundary hangover. Once you put a boundary in place and you tell somebody, no, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. I don't want to do it. And then later feel like you need to scramble and take it back because, oh my gosh, did I just push this person away or upset, kind of turn over the apple cart, so to speak, because I said what I needed and that I didn't go along with something. So, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about is that it is a process, right? Like you don't necessarily, you don't, you don't necessarily know until you know. (laughs) And so sometimes, you know, like you might say yes to something and later realize that you didn't like it. And that doesn't mean you made a mistake or that you were wrong or that that was bad. It just means, oh, wow, okay, I have more information now. Now I know something about a boundary that I didn't know before. And that it doesn't have to be like the end of the world. It can just be like, here's information. I now know that I don't like that, or I now know. And in fact, I think a lot of people's contracts end up sort of coming about because we didn't know, right? Like I didn't know I didn't want you making out with her in the back of the car until it happened. And then Mm -hmm. I realized I didn't like that. And so, and that can be a problem too in renegotiating that like they're, they're like, tell me a little bit about that. Cause sometimes Mm -hmm. I will hear people say, well, she agreed to it. Right. And there seems to be this feeling of like, once she said yes, then that yes should be forever. You know, and that is such a good point because when it comes to agreements, it is a living, breathing, evolving contract. And I hate to say contract because it's not black and white and it's not set in stone, but it will change because as humans, you're right. We cannot prepare for how we're going to feel in a situation or with a certain person And we might have different boundaries in different scenarios and with different people. And it's okay. There is nothing wrong with saying yes and then being able to shift and say, you know what? That doesn't feel like a yes for me anymore. For whatever reason, I'm not feeling it. And that is okay. So honoring yourself above all else. Know thyself. I think that's one of the keys in entering into this is being really clear with who you are, what you want, what you don't want. um, And giving permission for these agreements to constantly shift, right? They're, they're going to be compromising and negotiating. And sometimes you're going to get a little bit of what you want. And sometimes you're going to be giving up what you want. And, but is it worth it? Does it meet the goal of what you're both trying to achieve together? But I think that's a big one. Like nothing is set in stone and holding somebody to that, that doesn't serve the relationship as a whole, right? Because then there's a winner and then there's a loser in a way. And we need to create like a win-win that everybody's feeling supported and willing to work together. Cause sometimes you have to stop. You have to like maybe pause a little bit and back up and do some more work before you can move forward. Right. And what does it look like to like, as an individual, when you're doing that work of trying to pause and back up and maybe your partner has said, I, I, I can't, I can't feel like I thought I I thought this was a yes and now it's a no and you're feeling really disappointed or hurt or sad that this thing that you were hoping for or this you know this agreement that you thought you had has maybe changed again like what how do we manage how do we manage those feelings without sort of taking it out on our partner yeah that's a good one because I think you know there's a lot of examples that are coming to mind where Maybe, maybe the wife, the partner said, yes, okay, I will, let's do this and and agree to participate. And it maybe went farther than they had initially thought that it would, and then kind of pull back and say, yeah, this, this doesn't feel good. And sometimes the other person is really upset about it. It's kind of like reigning in a wild stallion sometimes who's been led out to pasture. Like they don't really want to do that. And there can be some resistance. And so 
really getting them to be on board with, you can only go as far as like the slowest person, <laughs> right? You've kind of got to move forward together and it sometimes requires doing some damage control. And maybe it's reestablishing trust, maybe it's reestablishing intimacy and a willingness to hear that concern and to, to pause. And that can be hard. So it's like creating some motivation, like how does this benefit me? If I can slow it down a little bit, pause, pour energy into our relationship, and, and hopefully with the intent that we'll still continue moving forward. I don't know what that looks like, but that there's a willingness for us to get on the same page and then continue taking steps, whatever that is. Right. And, you know, one thing that I have seen is that, you know, sometimes people take it really slow and they communicate really well and they, they, you know, like I've definitely had couples who, you know, like have these conversation over years and they finally get to the point where one person is still really wanting to move forward and the other person sort of realizes, yeah, that is just, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I was open to the idea. I thought about it. I, you know, fantasized with you. I did all the preparation and still here I am. And I just don't, I'm not feeling it. I don't think that's ever going to happen. And then they're, you know, like, they're they're sort of we've reached a you know like a we've reached an a oh sorry the word just left my brain the um a gridlock we've we've reached gridlock we we really want different things we've really done the exploration we've communicated well mm -hmm. and we really really want different things and that can happen absolutely but one of the things that i have noticed is that like in those cases you know like i've seen the, i've seen people break up I've seen people get divorces because, you know, like they just feel like they, they, you know, maybe still love each other. But I, I don't notice anybody ever regretting that they did that work together. That's one thing I have seen is that even when it doesn't sort of quote work out, the way we hope it would, if we never really do get to this point where like we're on the same page, mm -hmm. that it would still work worth doing together. Yeah. I guess I can't say that I'm, heard people do that i mean there might be hmm, yeah doing the work together because oftentimes i think there's a lot of benefits as like as far as learning to communicate more effectively somebody becoming more transparent in the relationship and they end up because you know if and actually opening up really amplifies a lot of what's underlying in the relationship that maybe needs work that people yeah. maybe haven't been addressing. Oftentimes when you embark on opening up a relationship, it brings all that to the surface. So those things kind of have to be addressed. And, and sometimes, yeah, getting to that place where somebody decides, you know, this just isn't for me. It's not who I am. I can't do it. I won't do it. And there can be a relief that if this hadn't happened, they might have still been spinning in that duck space of not making a decision. Right. And so, yeah, I haven't heard people regret it necessarily either, at least the work that gets done. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I wanted to say that because sometimes I will have people come in and say, you know, like, I'm so frustrated and I really, you know, like, what if I, what if we work on this together for a year or for two years and we're still at this place, you know, and, and, and yet when I have seen that happen, I, I don't feel like the couples that do that work and still end up divorcing that they that they regret it. That I feel like that they they feel like, wow, I really learned a lot about myself and my partner and we're, you know, like we're parting friends. That's what I've seen. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Like and that feels so much better than having just given up. Yeah, I would say so too. I definitely think that this process more times than not does bring about a increased self-awareness, deeper understanding of yourself and each other. So yeah, it's kind of like a crash course in self-awareness and growth, <laughs> I think. <laughs> and sometimes painful. Sometimes people get really tired of having to have these difficult conversations and having to navigate something. It can be kind of exhausting sometimes, I think, for people. Not everybody, but. I think I've heard a joke that it's like 98% contracting or discussion or talking and 2% sex. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate, but probably I think it can feel that way sometimes. You know, and I do want to, an interesting thing, and I thought about this earlier, and I wanted to say this, sometimes people, the one person who wants it the most 
and who's really pushing for it. It's kind of gung ho right out of the, you know, right out of the gate. Sometimes they have this overzealous fantasized idea of what it's all going to look like. And oftentimes I think when, and this is just speaking to males, this has just been my experience that they've been really excited about, you know, what kind of experiences and opportunities will be available to them. And there's been an, an interesting shift because oftentimes the female partner is not always too terribly stoked about it, but there's something, in, I don't know if you've seen this, you'll have to tell me if you've experienced this, but something happens if she does get on board with it, she will almost have, and this is just my own statistic here, 75% of the opportunity or more opportunity than he will have, if that makes sense. That's definitely my experience. And they're not really planning for that. They kind of have this idea that we're going to get out there and there's just going to be this wide array of people available and wanting what I want. And, and sometimes it's very out of balance. And once that starts to take place, it's kind of shocking for people. Like, oh, I didn't, one, think she was going to enjoy this. And two, think it was going to look this way, that there's going to be so much more opportunity on the female's end. And, you know, I even, I did read a statistic too that said that women actually tire of monogamy before men do. Interestingly, oh, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. This is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. When I read that, I was like, that's really fascinating. Um, yeah. I would love to, to read that wherever that was at. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a, you know, I feel like that it is a shame that there isn't more research on, you know, on all sexual issues, especially sexual issues that relate to women. I feel like there's a lot more research about erectile dysfunction than there is about mm -hmm. women. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. But I think that's particularly true. there's very little research out there about, you know, non-monogamy or any kind of n sort of, it's hard to get money to research that. It's mm -hmm. hard to, you know, get, can, you know, to yeah. get on board, to get universities and other places on board with the types of research that needs to be done. And, mm -hmm. and so anytime I hear that there's research out there, I'm like, what? Tell me more. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Well, there's a lot of stigma, you know, there's, a, as you've probably seen, a lot of people feel like they have to keep this very under wraps and very quiet, which is a little challenging. And how do you go about opening up when you're trying to also be a very private person with, you know, just the stigma and fear of, you know, judgment from other people or not necessarily being widely accepted. And so I think that might make it hard for, to gather information for research purposes. I think so. Yeah. And that's really hard for me when clients ask me like, what, you know, well, what are the chances this will, this will work out? Or and I'm like, that is not clear. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I've definitely seen, I've seen it go both ways myself. I can give mm -hmm. you anecdotal experience, but I can't really give you numbers. <clears throat> what I can mm -hmm. say is monogamy doesn't work out a lot of the time yeah. <laughs> either. <laughs> so yeah. it, well, I, think I I've seen yeah. so many different options of how, yeah, like and what you were saying, people kind of say yes to something and then they go, oh, that's not for me. And they back out. And then we kind of try something else. Well, this might feel okay to me. Maybe try that out. Yeah, that doesn't feel like a fit either. And so sometimes people are kind of, it's, it's shifting and in flux and evolving and it might look different. And five years down the road, Sometimes people even take a break from it, go through a little bit of a dry spell where they're not putting any energy anywhere else, but it might look different years down the road than when it initially looked like and what they thought they were embarking on. So for people to just understand, like giving it the room to just evolve over time and hopefully honor who they are, you know, as a couple and as individuals, rather than being kind of locked into what they think it has to be. Yeah. And I it looks think, different you know, everybody. I think like you said, there, there is, there are a lot of, you know, good resources out there. In the books you mentioned, there's some websites, there's groups that you can join where you can, you know, like kind of start to educate yourself on the array of the types of situations and relationships and experiences that people are interested in and things that work for different types of people in different contexts. And it turns out that, you know, like what you thought maybe opening up a relationship looks like, it, it, it can look so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I also see is, I mean, 
I generally don't see these people as couples, but I see a lot of, I, I, you know, I've seen plenty of couples where they really just aren't interested sexually in each other at all anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're not yeah. necessarily even interested in each other as a, as a, an emotional or, you know, like, yeah, you're kind of my friend and I live with you and we have kids together and we share finances sort of, but we both just sort of live our own lives. And that's sometimes, you know, like that's sometimes an option for people. And it certainly doesn't fit mm -hmm. in the, that idea that some people have of let's do this successfully, but it can be a really, it can be a really good option for certain couples in certain situations. And they both yeah. Absolutely, because there are a lot of people who their domestic partnership and their co-parenting is amazing. You know, I've met so many couples who are like, we do everything great, but our sex life. We connect in every way possible. We're best friends. We do all of these things. And so sometimes this is, yeah, it works great for, you know, certain people. And it's hard to tell who that will be sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I've seen... <laughs> I've seen so I've seen people who thought that they're like oh yeah I'm fine with them going out and having sex with whoever because I'm not really interested and then suddenly that awakens in them a realization that like oh when you're off having sex with other people suddenly I am interested in you yeah <laughs> that happened quite often too. and that even happens sometimes it when it wasn't an opening up situation like sometimes I've seen that happen in infidelity cases where I find yeah. out that you've been cheating on me and suddenly I think you're really sexy and people can yeah. question themselves like why do I why am I suddenly so interested in my husband who just cheated on me or my yeah. wife who just cheated on <laughs> that's me. actually a thing one of my professors I can't remember the wording they used but they always said the greatest aphrodisiac is knowing someone else is interested in your partner or if yeah. your partner is getting it from somewhere else somehow it has this creates this thing inside of us humans where we just want now all of a sudden we kind of want that person so it's a thing yeah. and so one of those things that this sort of brings up for me is I, I mean I definitely have people come in and say I feel like there's something wrong with me that I would think that that is sexy and so how do we deal with those narratives of like what is wrong with me that I would want this or that and sometimes that can even be reinforced by our partner, right? Like, mm -hmm. usually not if we think that it's sexy that they had the affair. Usually they might be relieved yeah. by that. But if, you know, like, if I tell my partner I'm interested in something that maybe wasn't ever discussed before, and they react to me with, like, disgust or shame, yeah. or, like, how do we, how do we process or handle, you know, like, des our desires in a way that, that can lead us to sexual health? Well, gosh, now we're getting into a little bit of the kink aspect. And that's, that's so interesting because often, especially when, when people get married really young or have only had sex with one partner, sometimes they've missed, there's this actual sexual developmental stage of adolescence is when our sexuality is activated. And then we go into the stage of like exploration and part of really starting to get in, in tune with who we are. And so many people miss out on that exploration and being able to know who they are sexually, what they want, what they need. We Sometimes we don't even do that until later in life. And so when people start coming to like identifying these things, especially things that might necessarily be inside the box, it's, it's really tapping into this new part of themselves that, well, one, we have all these different, you know, dogmas and rules and myths and false beliefs about sexuality so we can be really negative and judgmental towards ourselves and others and it can be really shocking for a partner when they've only known you in this specific way but now all of a sudden when you reveal these new parts of yourself or these new interests that nobody was aware of before sometimes it's difficult for both parties to wrap their head around because they're seeing you in a new light it has this whole other aspect and so for some people it's like oh my gosh, I've only been eating four meals my entire life and somebody just showed me that there's a chuck rama <laughs> You know, they go, they go to a buffet and they realize, wow, I didn't realize there's all these other things available to me, which can be shocking, you know, and it, that can bring up fear and insecurity for the partner because it's just different. It's new how to wrap their head around that and where they fit into it. Yeah. And I've found that sometimes there, there has to be some repair work done around that as well, right? Like if, if a partner reacted uh, or if you react to a partner in a way that's really judgmental or unkind, mm -hmm. 
sometimes, you know, like we have to do some soul searching and really figure out like, is that the way I want to speak about like this very vulnerable thing this person I love okay. shared with me, right? Like, and, and how can we, how can we reestablish trust and caring after we have sort of been unkind or un, mm -hmm. not very careful with each other? Yeah. And I caution people to listen, like hear them out and treat it like that's very interesting, right? Something that I, because sometimes people, will, you know, kind of shut down a little bit and have that negative response. And just being open to, again, open to the processing of it, open to getting more information, open to just a curiosity. That's a little different. I'm curious about that. Tell me more. But sometimes people don't even know really what to share about it because they're just discovering that for themselves. And back to the part about the partner potentially being aroused or turned on by, you know, the thought of their partner with someone else, like that's a thing too. That's not really that uncommon, but people, I think that throws people off a little bit because they don't know what it means. Like, what does this mean for me and how I feel about this person? And it doesn't always make sense, but it doesn't always have to. Yeah. Sometimes it's just accepting what it is. And some of those things stick long-term and sometimes they don't. So. Yeah. I think sometimes we can fall down a rabbit hole of wanting our sexual thoughts or feelings to make sense. And sometimes they kind of do, and sometimes they really just don't. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the tricky thing about a lot of our, you know, like that's also, that can be true of our angry self or our, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like we, we have these different parts of us that care about logic and other parts of us don't really care about logic that much. <laughs> and our sexy yeah. self doesn't necessarily care about logic that much. Right. But it does have its own internal logic sometimes if you can kind of set aside your preconceived ideas of what logic is supposed to look like, I guess. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this discussion. I always like to end with a question about like, after we've talked about all of these things, is there anything that we haven't yet brought up that you feel like would be a really good thing to discuss or lay out on the table? Hmm. Let's see. Well, I don't want to backtrack too much. Well, I was thinking, I don't know if, did we cover NRE, the uh -uh. relationship experience? I think I jotted that down just as a, something that sometimes seems to come up and I'll just talk quickly. Just sometimes I think really informing people of just what to expect chemically and hormonally when we enter into new experiences with opening up. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people can go, oh my gosh, I haven't felt this way in forever or if ever. And they can think that it means something else, that they should be somewhere else instead of where they are. And I always caution them of what that means or what that is. And that sometimes that does subside and just educating people around that because it can, it can be really powerful and potent and sometimes misunderstood. Right. And right. anyway, yeah, I just thought maybe that was important to ask. That your body flashes you full of pleasure hormones that just feel mm -hmm. amazing. And sometimes you can mistake those pleasure hormones that you have because your body is like, wee, new person that your body, yeah. you know, like that's some evolutionary programming. And you can mistake that for like long-term love or that there's something wrong with your other relationship. It's just that, you know, the chemical experience of long-term love is very different than the chemical experience of sort of like that first rush of a new relationship. Mm -hmm. And they're Absolutely. both very pleasurable. They can be both very pleasurable. It's just a different kind of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, thank you so much for this podcast. I'd love to have you come back on sometime and we can talk more in depth about kink since yeah. that's another big part of your training. Absolutely. I'd love it. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for listening to our podcast. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs>
We stop beneath the desert stars Wrapped in each other's arms Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary Sometimes we fell apart We always came back home Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary It's as simple as our love is That's how I wanna go All wrapped up in the arms of Our extraordinary It's nothing Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary.